Intimidator 305, new at King's Dominion. Inspired by Dale Earnhardt, it's the biggest, baddest, meanest coaster on the East Coast. A fitting tribute to the world's greatest driver. Intimidator 305, new this summer at King's Dominion. The legend rides on. Warning, some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. Intimidator 305 is undeniably one of the baddest roller coasters on the planet. The ride stands 305 feet, or nearly 93 meters tall, classifying the ride as a Giga Coaster. A Giga Roller Coaster is any coaster over the height of 300 feet, or 91 meters. The ride opened on April 2, 2010 at the King's Dominion Amusement Park in Doswell, Virginia and has delivered thrills to millions of riders. Intimidator 305 is famous for the intense experience it provides. Trains travel through the course at breakneck speeds, delivering riders ejector airtime, snappy side-to-side -side transitions, and an infinite amount of high positive g-forces. Positive g-forces are when your body gets pressed into the seat of the train during tight turns or transitions that make you feel heavier than normal. Intimidator 305 consists of 5,100 feet, or about 1,548 meters of bright red track. Along with being 305 feet, or 93 meters tall, Intimidator 305 sends riders down a 300 foot or 91 meter first drop sloped at 85 degrees. The ride's manufacturer, Intamin Amusement Rides, claims trains reach speeds of 146 kilometers per hour, or about 91 miles per hour. However, I have heard claims from King's Dominion that trains actually reach 94 miles per hour, or 151 kilometers per hour. As impressive as Intimidator 305 is, and as much as I love this roller coaster, I can't deny that I think this roller coaster is actually a total flop. At least from a business perspective, Intamin took many design risks with this coaster and I don't think that they have been received well by the general public. In this video, I will be giving you my thoughts and opinions on Intimidator 305, as well as an in-depth technical analysis of the ride. Before I talk about Intimidator 305, let's dig a bit backwards into the history of King's Dominion, but not too far, just far enough. From 1993 to 2006, King's Dominion was owned by Paramount Pictures, and the park went by the name Paramount's King's Dominion. Paramount Pictures were an interesting owner, and being a movie franchise, the company poured many movie-themed rides into the park, and a lot of launching roller coasters as well. Many of those coasters would serve as their own problematic roller coasters, like Volcano the Blast Coaster, a launching inverted roller coaster built by Intamin, may you rest in peace, or Hypersonic XLC, a launching air-compressed roller coaster built by SNS Worldwide, may you also rest in peace. On May 22, 2006, Cedar Fair Entertainment Company announced that they had purchased all of Paramount's amusement parks, so the company took over ownership and operation of King's Dominion. Cedar Fair sought to grow King's Dominion in both size and attendance, along with the rest of their new parks. The company tends to focus attention on only one or two parks a year, providing them with major investments. King's Dominion serves the Richmond, Virginia metropolitan area and has always competed with Busch Gardens Williamsburg, which is also nearby the Richmond area and is only about 74 miles or 119 kilometers away from King's Dominion. Cedar Fair tends to install major roller coasters to attract new guests. In 2008, King's Dominion received Dominator, a relocated floorless roller coaster built by Bolliger and Mabillard, or B&M for short, which originally operated at the Geauga Lake Amusement Park, which Cedar Fair had so kindly closed in 2007. Being a relocated roller coaster, Dominator was not a new attraction. But based on the actual new attractions that Cedar Fair installed at their new parks, the chain appeared to install large hyper roller coasters by B&M, or coasters over the height of 200 feet, or 61 meters. Cedar Fair installed Behemoth at Canada's Wonderland in 2008, followed by Diamondback at Kings Island in 2009. So the logical move for King's Dominion would be to install a hyper roller coaster. But the issue is that the nearby Busch Gardens Williamsburg already had a B&M hyper coaster, Apollo's Chariot, which has operated at Busch Gardens since 1999. It looks like that in order to make sure King's Dominion competed properly with Busch Gardens, Cedar Fair sought to outdo Busch Gardens Williamsburg with an even more impressive roller coaster. And they did just that when King's Dominion announced on August 20th, 2009 that they would be adding Intimidator 305. The park skipped a hyper roller coaster altogether and went straight to a Giga roller coaster, which is a coaster over the height of 300 feet or 91 meters. Plus, the ride was named after Dale Earnhardt, a famous NASCAR driver who went by the name The Intimidator. With the ride being located in the southern United States, it was clear that Cedar Fair were targeting the millions of NASCAR fans in the area, as well as combining the theme with the extremely impressive stats of the roller coaster. The ride was intended to be the biggest, baddest, and meanest coaster on the East Coast. From a marketing perspective, this roller coaster should have been perfect to draw many people to King's Dominion. Intimidator 305, or I-305 for short, is located towards the back of the park. After passing Flight of Fear, the ride is located in its own little area that is tucked away behind Anaconda. Riders pass through the concrete entrance portal and are greeted with the sheer size of the coaster as it towers in front of them. 
After passing through the very short queue line, riders board into one of I-305's two trains. Each train is 8 cars long and seat a total of 32 riders. Riders secure their over-the-shoulder restraints and secure their seat belts. Upon dispatch, riders are told to start their imaginary car engines. The train gets pulled out of the station by the cable lift and quickly begins to ascend the 45 degree lift tilt. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I-305 uses a cable instead of a chain to pull trains up the lift hill. Cables are far lighter than chain links, which means the lift motor can pull the train much faster. The lift hill structure only features two supports, which is beyond minimalistic. This helps the ride live up to its name and gives the ride quite an intimidating appearance. It also helps to save on the cost of producing more support pieces, which is the main reason why this was done. The lift track is braced by a sturdy backbone that extends up the entire lift hill. After just about 20 seconds, the train reaches the top of the lift hill and begins the crest. Unlike Millennium Forest at Cedar Point, which features a very wide crest, I-305 features a much smaller crest. Riders receive a good amount of airtime as the train hauls down the drop, especially in the back rows. Now personally, I do prefer Millennium Force's drop to I-305's because Millennium's drop feels longer with the wider crest, and with the lap bars, it also feels like it has more airtime. Both Millennium Force and I-305 feature a 300-foot or 91-meter first drop, but I-305's first drop is certainly no slouch and delivers a great dose of ejector airtime. The train hits a tight pullout which then leads into a highly banked turn. This bank turn is nearly a ground level as trains reach their top speed of over 90 miles per hour, or roughly 146 kilometers an hour. Now this tight turn is one of I-305's most infamous elements. Many riders commonly black out on this turn due to the excessive positive g-forces that are highly sustained. Blacking out on a roller coaster is when riders temporarily lose vision due to high positive g-forces. The positive g-forces are applied as the train begins to pull out of the 85 degree drop and continue through the low to the ground turn. The turn we have now is actually a modified turn, which is more forgiving to riders than the original turn was. I'll discuss that more later in the video. With the current turn, the train begins to gradually climb into the air about midway through the curve. This helps to alleviate the forces placed on riders. Now even with this modification, I tend to still gray out on the turn almost every single ride. A gray out is like a minor blackout, so you haven't completely lost your vision yet, but you're kind of starting to. I've even had a few rides where I completely lost my vision and it did not return until the airtime hill which comes up next. And I don't black out that often on a ride. It's pretty rare for me. After the train gradually climbs out of the curve, the ride enters a long and sustained 150 foot or 46 meter tall airtime hill. This airtime hill is half the height of the first drop, so the train absolutely flies over the top of the hill, delivering riders several seconds of sustained ejector airtime. It's absolutely one of my favorite airtime hills ever. I just wish it were experienced with lap bars instead of over-the-shoulder restraints, but the over-the-shoulder restraints are very necessary for what comes next. The train drops out of the airtime hill and heads back to ground level where Intimidator spends most of the ride. The ride banks to the right, delivering more positive g-forces. The train climbs upward into a small speed hill where the ride suddenly unbanks, snapping riders to an upright position while also delivering ejector airtime. Then after a brief moment, the train snaps back to the left again as it slams into a tight left turn. This element is bizarre as it combines high speeds with high lateral forces as well as ejector airtime. And even though this element is taken at probably near 80 miles per hour or 129 kilometers per hour, you can still feel each individual portion of the element, even if everything is very rapid fire. And with the snappy transitions, those over-the-shoulder restraints serve the purpose of holding riders' bodies upright. The train continues through a low-to-the-ground left-hand turn that is nearly at ground level. Riders are slammed with a high amount of positive g-forces that the train rockets through the turn at probably well over 75 miles per hour or 120 kilometers per hour. Riders exiting Intimidator 305 will hear the echoes of trains as they roar above. The train continues through this nearly 270 degree bank turn and climbs a bit higher in the air. The train is banked at nearly 90 degrees and very quickly banked to the right at again nearly 90 degrees. The snap is so intense and is one of my favorite features of the coaster. The snap features both lateral forces and airtime, similar to Maverick at Cedar Point which I discussed in my previous video. The train continues through a forceful right turn that takes riders back to ground level. The train hits a second snap which sends riders flying from left to right. Riders are again slammed with lateral and airtime forces. These snaps are very comparable to the snaps on Maverick at Cedar Point, but they are much more intense. On Maverick, trains are not as banked when they enter a snap and are banked less out of the snap. On I-305, trains enter and exit a bank at a much higher angle so there is more rotation. If I had to compare I-305 snaps to anything, they may be similar to the original Heartline roll that Maverick had, but I'm sure the Heartline roll was still far more intense. And obviously I-305 snaps don't go upside down. The ride exits the second snap and enters a low to the ground 180 degree bank turn. Riders are again hit with a high amount of positive g-forces. The train is now traveling parallel to the first drop as it climbs upward into a second large airtime hill. Now this part of the ride is the only problem I have with I-305. 
The train engages a large amount of fixed magnetic trim brakes which slow down the coaster. Now if your train is filled with riders, you won't notice the trims all too much, but it's a bit different for an empty train, I'll get more into that later. Anyway, the train still hits the airtime hill with good speed and delivers good airtime to riders, although I've never gotten as much airtime on this hill as I do on the larger airtime hill earlier on the ride. The train drops out of the airtime hill and pulls up into a smaller airtime hill, which hence the name, also delivers riders a good amount of airtime. But at the top of this hill, the ride banks to the right and heads towards the most extreme snap of the ride. The train is rotated heavily to the right and suddenly snaps left, delivering a ridiculous amount of lateral and airtime forces. The trim brakes are absolutely necessary so that this element doesn't kill people, and the trim brakes were 100% designed into the ride. The ride enters a low to the ground left hand turn that flies underneath the speed hill earlier on the ride. The ride pulls up and hits one last snap as the train flies into a very tall final brake run. Riders are given a great dose of ejector airtime as the train levels out, which is a great way to end the ride. Overall, Intimidator 305 is one of the most intense roller coasters I have ever ridden, there's no question about it. It's a coaster that I love to ride over and over again when I visit Kings Dominion, and if I had to pick a roller coaster to ride right now, this would be high up on my list. I'm sure many roller coaster enthusiasts like me would say the same thing. Compared to a ride like Millennium Forest at Cedar Point, or Fury 325 at Carowinds, which are two other Giga coasters, I-305 absolutely shits on these coasters when it comes to intensity. Intimidator 305 is seriously on another level, and it's one thing that I can't get enough of the ride. Now I do wish the coaster was longer, as it only takes about 45 seconds from when you head down the first drop to when you hit the final brake run, but maybe it's a good thing the coaster is so short, as a lot of riders already find the coaster unbearable and it would be even worse if it were any longer. And I'm not kidding, it seems that a lot of riders actually find I-305 unbearable, or just too intense. While a seasoned roller coaster rider like me will have no problem riding I-305 over and over again, the average person could find just one ride on this coaster all too much. And that is where the first problem arises with this coaster. As entitled as roller coaster enthusiasts feel, and they shouldn't feel entitled by the way, please remember that roller coasters should be designed for the masses to enjoy, not just enthusiasts. While Intamin absolutely nailed I-305 from an enthusiast perspective, I think in the eyes of the general public, who make up the majority of an amusement park's attendance numbers, I-305 was an absolute flop. To most, this coaster lives up to its name a little too much and is too intimidating. The coaster began to develop a bad reputation amongst the general public in just its opening year, when it became widespread that the coaster caused many riders to black out. While coaster enthusiasts may be attracted to the idea of this for some reason, normal people are not, and honestly for good reason. While an enthusiast will enjoy the idea of a roller coaster being so intense that it causes temporary loss of vision, normal people have less strange things in their lives that they care more for. So if it means skipping out on a roller coaster that they hear causes temporary loss of vision, they will simply skip the ride, as roller coasters are not their top priority. But in effect, while Cedar Fair had the intention for this roller coaster to dominate the market, it doesn't really. Massive coasters that are much more gentle, like Millennium Forest or Fury 325 do instead. All three of these coasters were built at a massive scale to attract visitors. Guests return to parks over and over again for Millennium Forest or Fury 325, but I don't think they do for I-305. Now, coaster enthusiasts definitely return for I-305, but remember, coaster enthusiasts are a very small fraction of a park's attendance, so we don't make them that much money. And the general public who consists of most of the park's attendance is where a park really makes their money. And money is important. This is how parks pay for these expensive roller coasters and how they eventually buy new ones, so they can't just buy every single ride that you want and place them in the park. They have to do things that make sense. And I'm talking to you, roller coaster enthusiasts. I'm talking to you. And if you're mad at all the GP for thinking I-305 is too intense, well, just keep in mind that they paid for this roller coaster, not really you, since they make up the majority of the attendance numbers. I-305 reportedly cost 25 million US dollars, and I don't think Cedar Fair or Kings Dominion are content with their purchase. I-305 was built with the intent to continually attract new guests and keep them coming back once they came and rode once, but I generally don't think it does. Guests who found I-305 too intense would probably go on to spread word that the coaster causes blackouts, which probably scared many members of the general public away from even attempting to try the coaster. It's important for a ride to have a good reputation, as this helps make a ride more popular. But I think I-305 has had a bad reputation amongst the general public all along. The only time I ever waited in line for I-305 is when I rode on a hot summer day in 2011, when the ride was running one train. Since then, I have visited Kings Dominion several times, and I have never seen a line longer than a train or two for I-305, even if the ride is only running one train. Now granted, the ride has a higher capacity than most other roller coasters at Kings Dominion, but a coaster of this size and caliber should be the most popular attraction at the park. Just look at the two Giga roller coasters that operate at Cedar Point or Carowinds, they are extremely popular. 
I-305 has only done more than 1 million riders in a single season once, and that was during the ride's opening year in 2010. And mind you, I-305 still wasn't the most ridden roller coaster that year. Dominator actually did several thousand riders more than I-305 for the 2010 season. Now granted, I-305 did suffer a lot of downtime its opening year and only ran one train a large amount of the time, but it just blows my mind that the coaster doesn't have people driving from hours away for this ride. For what it is, this coaster should be the most popular ride at the park and also in the area. I-305 was supposed to dominate over its neighboring competitor, Apollo's Chariot at Busch Gardens, or even Griffin at Busch Gardens, which is a B&M dive machine that takes guests down two vertical drops. But I guarantee you that if you were to ask a member of the general public who has ridden I-305, Apollo's Chariot, and Griffin which coaster they prefer, they would choose Apollo's Chariot or Griffin, as both of these coasters are very enjoyable and not overly intense. This means that most guests might choose to go to Busch Gardens Williamsburg for the day, rather than King's Dominion. I hear that Cedar Fair had planned to scale up King's Dominion earlier along, after they purchased the park from Paramount, and I'm sure there are more immediate plans to follow up I-305. But after I-305 didn't really do what it was intended to do, I think Cedar Fair shifted focus immediately to Carowinds, which is seeing better results. Carowinds also installed a roller coaster named Intimidator for the 2010 season as well, only their Intimidator is a B&M hyper roller coaster, just like Apollo's Chariot, and is far more popular with the general public than the more intense I-305. With attention now shifted to other parks, it meant years of smaller additions for King's Dominion, while other Cedar Fair parks received large scale roller coasters. Now, if I-305 wasn't a flop with the general public, I guarantee you that we would have seen a few more major attractions installed at King's Dominion between the addition of I-305 in 2010 and Twisted Timbers in 2018. Twisted Timbers is the park's hybrid conversion of the former Hurler Wooden Roller Coaster, built by Rocky Mountain Construction. Now, King's Dominion has a lot of competition. There's Busch Gardens Williamsburg, which serves the Richmond area, but Busch Gardens does far better attendance-wise than King's Dominion, so Busch Gardens dominates the Richmond market. And then there's Washington, D.C. that's about an hour and a half away from King's Dominion, but Hershey Park actually pulls more guests from the Washington area than King's Dominion, and tourists that are traveling to the area will typically go to Busch Gardens over King's Dominion, so King's Dominion is unfortunately a secondary park for many. The purpose of Intimidator 305 was to make King's Dominion a first-choice park, but since it didn't, Cedar Fair had to turn attention elsewhere for now. It's not like the park can simply delete I-305 and recoup their money like in Roller Coaster Tycoon. Cedar Fair would have to pour another massive investment into the park to do what I-305 was intended to, which takes away money from what the chain had planned for other parks or projects. Money doesn't grow on trees for the theme park industry. From what I hear, King's Dominion only does about 1.7 to 1.8 million visitors a year. And with the removal of Volcano, which I thought was the major ride that attracted the general public to King's Dominion, I don't see this number climbing anytime soon. Now, if I-305 were built at another park like King's Island that attracts more visitors naturally, I don't think it would be nearly as much of a flop. The ride probably would have found more dedicated fans amongst the general public since the park has more visitors. This would have helped to better the ride's reputation, and instead of people being scared altogether to ride I-305, I-305 would serve as the ultimate thrill machine at the park that only the bravest guests challenge. This would probably attract even more guests as people are drawn to what they fear. But in the case of King's Dominion, which has a smaller population pool, the park would have probably been better off with like a clone of Millennium Force instead. Intimidator 305 was also the last major roller coaster that Cedar Fair has purchased from Intamin. During the 2000s, Cedar Fair had purchased a long list of roller coasters from Intamin, and Cedar Fair seemed to be very much in favor of Intamin, even if Intamin coasters usually came with their own unique set of problems. But the problems were usually worth it, as the coasters were so good that guests spread good word about them, which led to more and more guests returning over and over for another ride. But the two Intamins that Cedar Fair purchased for 2010, well, didn't. Cedar Fair had also purchased Shoot the Rapids, a log flume styled water ride from Intamin for the 2010 season at Cedar Point. Shoot the Rapids would end up being a complete disaster and probably should have never been built. And then I-305 was plain and simply too intense for the average rider. Riders commonly blacked out on the first 270 degree helix which immediately followed the first drop. I-305 certainly satisfied the average roller coaster enthusiast, but not the majority of people that it needed to. To make a comparison, I-305 is like a blown up Intamin Megalite roller coaster. The Megalite coasters built by Intamin are fun sized airtime machines that also deliver some very strong positive g-forces. While not exactly the same, Intimidator 305 follows a similar ride path to its smaller cousin, the Megalite, like Kawasemi at Tobu Z Park. The Megalites are only 102 feet or 31 meters tall and reach speeds of 53 miles per hour or 85 kilometers per hour. 
When designing Intimidator 305, it looks like Intamin took a Megalite, multiplied its size by 3, and then added the snaps from Maverick at Cedar Point, and of course, they made everything way more intense because innovation. This design language would bite Intamin in the butt and called for major design changes early in the coaster's career. Not too long after the grand opening, a set of magnetic trim brakes were added to Intimidator's first drop to slow down trains so that the g-forces during the first turn were more tolerable. It was reported that the trim brakes slowed trains to 78 miles per hour, or about 126 kilometers per hour, and many of the snaps leading up to the second airtime hill were tamed a bit as well. The ride was effectively the same once it hit the second airtime hill, as the trims from this airtime hill were removed and placed on the first drop. But even with this modification, I still hear that many riders would gray or black out during the first helix which was just too long and sustained. It was also common for I-305 to wear through running wheels on the train far too quickly. Wheels would need to be replaced very often, as the coaster was practically melted through them. Wheels were supposed to last at least 14 days, and it was reported that many wheels would wear out after less than one day of use. And these wheels aren't cheap to replace either. Oftentimes, the ride would only run one train during its opening year to allow the other train to have worn out wheels swapped for fresh ones, or even just to give the wheels a break. The park even installed water coolers on the brake run that sprayed down wheels to cool them off. Now this issue wasn't just with I-305. Intamin's first Giga roller coaster, Millennium Force, also wore through wheels very quickly in its opening year. Each of these coasters required a new wheel compound that Intamin eventually got right. So I-305 and Millennium Force both seem to be okay nowadays with not blowing through wheels. After the 2010 season came to a close, Intamin came back to the park and reprofiled a large section of the coaster. The low to the ground 270 degree helix immediately following the first drop was modified so that about halfway through the turn, trains would rise higher into the air. This helped to alleviate forces on riders, but this also required that the approach of the first airtime hill be heavily modified as well. Intamin had to fabricate new track and support pieces to accomplish this. I'm curious who had to pay for this modification, and if I had to guess, Intamin probably took the bill for this blunder. Luckily, this modification allowed for the trim brakes that were placed on the first drop to be relocated back to their original location on the second large airtime hill later in the ride. Following these modifications, I-305s appeared to run smoothly. But in this day and age of computer-aided drafting and design, I don't see how I-305 was designed and built so that it would require a heavy remodification later. Or maybe I-305 was an attempt by Intamin to strengthen the human body. Sander Kernix, comment down below if you're watching. Now, Intamin didn't screw up everything. In fact, there is so much that they got right with I-305, especially from an operation standpoint. If you remember from my video on Millennium Force, which is the first Giga roller coaster built by Intamin, there was room for improvement. One issue with Millennium is that the trim section of the final brake run is too flat, and all the magnetic brakes are fixed in place. The trim is the first portion of the brake run immediately following the last overbank turn. The section is designed to slow trains down to a coast so that trains advance into the waiting brake at a proper speed. Fast-moving trains that are filled with riders will slow down as designed and will coast through the trim and quickly advance into the waiting brake. But a slow-moving train or a train that is empty of riders will slow to a crawl on the trim, which delays how often trains can be dispatched from the station. I-305 is just like Millennium Force, in the sense that the final brake run is divided into two sections. The first portion of the brake run is the trim section, which will not fully stop a train, but will slow trains down to a desired speed. The train then advances into the waiting brake, which is where the train can actually come to a stop if needed. I-305 and Millennium's last hills are around the same height. On Millennium, the train drops back lower to the ground before hitting the trim, but on I-305, the trim utilizes the full height of the last hill, which allows the trim to slope downwards at a steep angle. The last few brake fins on the trim are also adjustable. Together, these design elements allow all trains to quickly advance through the trim no matter what. So even a slow-moving empty train will quickly advance through the trim. This helps to keep operations very consistent. Let's talk about the block zones found on I-305. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of a ride that only one train may occupy at a time. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop a train from proceeding into the next block if that block is occupied. This is the safety system that prevents roller coaster trains from colliding with each other. I-305 features a total of only three block zones. The block zones are as follows. The station block, the lift block, and the waiting block. The waiting block is the section of brake run immediately before the station. Remember that the trim section of the final brake run is not capable of stopping a train, thus it is not a block. Compared to Millennium Force, the only difference between I-305 and Millennium is that Millennium possesses a separate unload station. This brings the total block zone count on Millennium to 4, which allow it to run 3 trains. With only 3 blocks in I-305, this means it can only run 2 trains. As a rule of thumb, every roller coaster can basically operate one train less than the number of block zones, so if a ride has four block zones, it can only run three trains at most, as there always has to be at least one available block zone the trains can begin advancing into. Now even though Millennium Force has an additional train on the track, I-305 is actually capable of cycling more trains per hour than Millennium, at least I think. 
I know for a fact that Millennium can cycle 36 trains an hour. Now I don't have the exact cycle count for I-305, but I believe it's around 40 trains per hour. This gives I-305 a theoretical capacity of 1,280 riders per hour with its 32 passenger trains. That's only 16 riders shy of Millennium's 1,296 riders per hour thanks to its larger 36 passenger trains. Now granted, I-305 is a shorter ride time-wise than Millennium, which is a part of the reason it can cycle more trains per hour. But it's still cool to see a ride with only two trains capable of cycling more times per hour than a similar roller coaster that has three trains. The funny thing is that Intamin claim I-305 is capable of 1,500 riders per hour. For 1,500 riders per hour, this would require a dispatch from the station every 76.8 seconds. I'm not really sure how this is possible, but this isn't the first time I've seen Intamin claim an incorrect capacity figure. In fact, almost every single Intamin coaster that I've made a problematic coaster video on has an incorrect capacity figure supplied by Intamin. Now, I-305's lift hill was slowed down slightly sometime around 2013, so maybe with the original speed of the lift hill, 1,500 was slightly more possible, but I still don't think so. I also see the figure 1,300 350 riders per hour on the internet pretty often for I-305. 1,350 sounds a bit more likely with the original faster lift hill, but just maybe. I hear King's Dominion actually list the ride at 1,024 riders per hour in their operating manuals, but I think the ride is capable of a bit more than that with its short cycle time. If you've ever operated I-305, please comment down below if you know any more on the topic. Now, if you remember from my Magnum XL200 video where I discussed how ride operators cannot stack, I-305 is actually the opposite. Due to the fast lift hill and lack of block zones, ride operators essentially have to stack a train in the waiting break before dispatch. This ensures that the train on the waiting break pulls into the station before the train ascending the lift hill gets to the top. Otherwise, it would be forced to stop at the top of the lift hill as the waiting block zone clears. Some rides will get around this issue by featuring variable speed lift hills that run slowly until the block zone ahead clears. Then once the block zone ahead clears, the lift hill speeds up. But I-305 only has one lift speed, regardless if block zones are clear, and that speed is super fast. Whereas Millennium Force has a variable speed lift hill that allows trains to advance forward to clear block zones. Some other roller coasters will also feature an insane multi-move system, where trains move almost exactly at the same time, like Skyrush at Hershey Park. Now I-305 has multi-move, but it's like a junior form of multi-move. The train on the waiting break will begin motion before the train dispatching the station leaves the platform entirely, but not very early. Digging back a little bit into rider comfort, Intamin also supplied the park with new over-the-shoulder straps just a few weeks after the ride opened in 2010. The original straps were a hard red strap. Riders would often bash their head or neck into these straps during the snappy transitions, leading to a very uncomfortable and sometimes painful experience. Along with the ride being too intense, it was also a common complaint that the ride was painful because of the hard straps. To help remedy the problem, Intamin supplied the park with a set of softer black straps which are much more forgiving to riders' necks and heads during the sharp transitions. But along with that, as fast and intense as I-305 is, I've always found the ride to be pretty buttery smooth for what it is. Trains fly along the course pretty smoothly without much rattle or bumpiness. I-305 also features a newer track and support design from Intamin that Intamin now uses on their more intense roller coasters. Unlike other Intamin track which feature a triangular or square shaped design, this new track uses a strong double spine that is tubular in shape. This allows the track to be extremely strong while also requiring less support pieces. This helps to reduce the cost of these roller coasters. The supports are also square in shape for added strength and also simplicity when fabricating them. Skyrush at Hershey Park also features this track and support design, and the new Jurassic roller coaster being installed at Islands of Adventure will feature this track design as well. Going back to the ride experience in I-305, there is only one thing about the ride that prevents me from ranking it as one of my all-time favorite coasters, and that would be the fixed magnetic trim brake on the second airtime hill. Like I was saying before about Millennium Force's trim section on its final brake run, fixed magnetic brakes will slow down an empty train far more than a fully loaded train. The trim brakes on the second airtime hill were absolutely designed into the ride to make the last few hills workable with the space provided and budget provided. There is no question about that, but I just wish that some of the brake fins on the hill were adjustable. With the ride having a pretty good capacity and also not being very popular, trains are often dispatched in I-305 close to empty, at least when I ride. Even with an empty train, the ride tears through the course like no other until it hits that trim brake. With the lack of weight, the train feels like it slows down to a near crawl, which just kills the remaining hills of the ride for me. And it kills me because 
because I know how good the last few hills of the ride are with a fully loaded train, but I can never seem to get a ride in I-305 with a fully loaded train. My best ride on the coaster was in 2011 when I got my first ever ride. I rode in the back row in a fully loaded train and boy was that a great experience. The ride was non-stop from start to finish. This is because a fully loaded train will slow down to the desired speed and still clear the remaining hills with plenty of energy. But since then, every time I've ridden I-305, my train has been nearly empty of riders which just ruins the last few hills for me, especially since I know how good they can be. It's for this reason that I just wish the trim brake was adjustable to account for slow moving trains or empty trains. This would allow for a consistent riding experience every single time I ride the coaster. I think if this were the case, I-305 would be a top 5 coaster for me. I know people complain about the trim brakes on B&M coasters, but B&M coasters do feature adjustable trim brakes that do account for how fast trains are running. So the trim brakes will hit harder if trains are running too fast, or if trains are running slower, they won't hit at all. I think this would be a great substitution for I-305. It would have also been nice if the coaster were designed so that it didn't require trim brakes at all, like Millennium Force at Cedar Point. But I imagine Cedar Fair only had so much budget for I-305, which led to the ride being a whole 1,495 feet or 456 meters shorter in track length than Millennium Force. The ride is also located on a much smaller plot of land than Millennium is. Thus, in order to make the ride workable in the space while still reaching a height of 300 feet or 91 meters, the ride had to be trimmed so that all of the coaster would fit in the tight plot of land. Otherwise, the last few hills would need to be much larger than they are now, which is probably an issue due to land restrictions and budget. But oh well, I guess this wouldn't be as much of a problem if the ride was extremely popular or if King's Dominion had a higher attendance, so that every time I rode the ride, I had a train full of riders with me to go against that trim brake. Now, I am aware that the ride does run very well when the train is filled with riders, but something that's very important for me is that a roller coaster is consistent, and for me, I-305 just isn't consistent. So that will conclude this episode of Problematic Roller Coasters. Overall, I think I-305 does live up to the original marketing as the biggest, baddest, and meanest roller coaster on the East Coast, but just a little too much. While I absolutely love this ride, I don't think the coaster performs nearly as well as it was intended to with the general public, which is honestly more important than how roller coaster enthusiasts vibe with an attraction. I think King's Dominion would see higher attendance numbers and may have also received a few major attractions of I-305 was a major draw for crowds. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that you get notified the next time I post a video. Thanks for watching and be safe. Peace.